Dr. Paul, Dr. Terry, a new season of Botched is upon us, mm-hmm. and we are so blessed because there are some wild stories that we're seeing on this new season. It's like whenever a season comes out, I never know what to expect, and I don't know how you guys are going to top the last season, but you f- you find ways to do it. You find the people. How would you sum up this season? Uh, we, we've topped all other seasons combined. This is a really interesting combination of deformities that people are born with that had plastic surgery and it failed or traumatic deformities or the regular people had plastic surgery that just went awry. So it's a really interesting full spectrum of complicated plastic surgery. Very difficult. We had some complications that we had to fix of our own before we went backwards on a couple before we could go forwards. There were a few botched by the botch doctors moments But I think we came out way, way ahead. And for me, one of the most refreshing things about this season is the first season of all eight seasons that he did not actually have plastic surgery. Here it goes. Wow. We're not counting the gallons (laughs) of Botox and filler. Okay. I'm saying. (laughs) But I, I, but I did a lot of that. But I do have something done, which is almost surgical, but I can't talk about it yet. Oh, yeah. You'll have to watch it. Um, with that comment in mind, or the comments about the show, so this year for me, there's a lot of patients where I have to personally, which is rare for me to go back over and over and over again to keep getting improvements, or the tissue keeps falling apart on mm-hmm. the face. So it keeps failing. And um, it's hard to get that extra step. Uh, so the patient quality of tissue Unfortunately, because of the damage it sustained is poor, which makes surgery a lot harder to do. Well, we took patients we wouldn't normally take in the first seven seasons. What inspired that? Like, was it just you guys, like you were doing it for seven years, we want to up the ante or you just kind of like- It's the stories. Well- For me, it's those stories. Well, yeah, I think it is the stories, but I think- Plastic surgeons get better with experience and very few plastic surgeons get to do complicated plastic surgery every single day. So honestly, when you build up all of that experience, you know, Mm -hmm. you can bring it to bear to much, much more complicated patients than we normally would do. The first three, four, five seasons, we wouldn't have done 80% of these patients. They were just set up for failure, too difficult. The tissue quality was too bad. But, you know, we have... There's no other way to put it. I mean, you know, if you get to do this stuff long enough, you sort of get a superpower. And we sort of, at, we're at the top of our game. This is the peak of our surgical experience and our surgical abilities. And uh, you watch this season, this is the hardest stuff we've ever done. Yeah, it was almost hard to get through like the first three minutes of the premiere episode i mean these surgeries are no joke and you guys mentioned that you kind of the botched doctors did a little bit of botched work before they you know could make things better talk to us about the pressure you feel being the botched docs and these people are coming to you with their stories they're being so vulnerable and they hope that you're able to fix them now you're talking about stress and about the intensity of these procedures one thing about us is since we're used to dealing with high stress all the time I mean, we've been doing this for many, many years, these hard, hard cases. And so we're used to being under the stress. We're, we're used to patients that want a lot. And we try to dial them down. So what's something I have to tell you that it's nothing new. It's constant high stress, high stakes, every surgery that we do. But it's funny, when you ask that question, I... I usually give that answer and I usually feel that way, but this season I resonated with that. I resonate with that question. This for me, there's a sometimes when you get overly emotionally invested in their story, it adds a level of stress, like, oh my gosh, I've got to fix this. Okay. Particularly this case that he did of this woman with this tumor from another country that was just growing on her face, went to the main university at the two to have this fixed. They opened it up and I call it a peak and shriek. It started bleeding so much. They just closed it and said, forget it, too dangerous. So she had to continue living with this tumor on her face that grew so much it hung down below her jawline. And so Paul did something 
really special, some real genius work this season that everyone can look forward to. I feel that's what so um, makes like the show so captivating to watch, but makes it so, I feel like hard for the two of you to juggle because it's not just like you're able to scrub in and do the surgery and the procedure, you get attached to the people. And what a lot of the things they're dealing with is something that has been like emotionally draining to them for almost their entire life and kind of has like, messed up their personal lives and everything like that. And how do you guys like juggle the conversations with them about that? And then on the flip side too, how do you guys like check out, like are able to go about your day without being so at like attached to the right amount? You know, it's um, interesting. The two of us are very different, polar opposites of how we handle the pre-ops and the expectations. Mm -hmm. I'm more of the hard ass and I give it to them straight about what to expect. And if they can't handle it, I'm not touching it. You know, and I tell them, I, you can't do A, B, and C, and D. He's more of the very friendly type to them during that period of time. But again, I'm tough. And, and this is something that when it comes to these types of surgeries, you know, we have to make sure that the patient is realistic. Mm. But your point is well taken because in our regular practices, and other doctors will tell you the same. You don't get to know the patients as well as you do on Botched. That's I mean, true. we sit there and we film with them for two and a half hours, learning about their families, their stories. So we get as emotionally invested as you might get watching the show, even more so. Whereas in our regular practice, patient comes in, we're very nice to them. We meet them. We say, hi, how are you? Okay, what's the problem yes. with these patients? So there's a lot more stress to your point Big because dive, we yeah. really take a deep dive. So that adds a lot more risk and emotional investment to it. it makes it more difficult. You guys have reversed so many extreme and botched surgeries over the years. And I feel like in, in recent years, there's been this trend of sort of d decreasing some of the augmentations that people have had, whether it's like butt filler or, you know, d removing their breast implants. What do you guys make of that trend? And I don't know if you have any thoughts on Black China's recent uh, plastic surgery removal journey because she's taken out all the fillers. She took out the butt job and she looks really, really good. And she seems to be in a great place. No, I, I'm, okay. bit, by the way, I won't take that question. I'm very happy to see that trend of people who have plastic surgery to back it off a little bit to go either smaller with the implants, take the implants out. Less is more in many things in life. And clearly it's that way in plastic surgery. So I love this sort of reversal trend. One day, one day there will be a way to tighten the skin, to do certain things that we want to do without having to use a scalpel and sutures and dissection. But you have to realize plastic surgery is like any other surgery. It has all the same risks and you have to be very, very careful. So I love the the sort of softer, more subtle trend that's happening right now. And if someone is like sort of like looking to reverse surgeries, like do you have any advice for those people on how to approach it? Because I feel like the people who have you know, had extreme surgeries probably want to go extreme in the other direction and maybe aren't doing their research or, you know, checking out the best doctors. Like, what could you tell those people? So I think reversing surgery is difficult. It's a lot more difficult than what we call primary surgery or surgery on people who've never been done before. So you've got to be really careful who you pick to be your surgeon to reverse the surgery because it's a lot more complicated. The blood supply isn't as good. There's previous scarring. So make sure you go to a board certified plastic surgeon with a lot of gray hair or with no hair, who has got a <laughs> lot of experience doing that kind of surgery, all right? Because one of the things we see on Botched is, you know, medical tourism, people are trying to save money so they go to another country, they have a problem, they come back here and it's twice as expensive and twice as difficult. So you get what you pay for, but when it comes to reversal surgery, go to someone with a lot of experience. I know. I get so worried when people are like, I got a Groupon for something. I'm like, you're not going to want a Groupon on your face because I don't think that will end well. <laughs> I agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Discount plastic surgery is not a good idea. And I call it an asymmetrical risk. Okay. Because every time you have plastic surgery, you take a risk, but you pay a little money, but your risk starts to go up. So be very careful. Mm -hmm. 
you guys were talking about make sure you go to a surgeon with a lot of gray hair and that had me thinking when you guys were first starting out do you remember your first like big plastic surgery each like what the operation was oh yeah you're talking about when we first started the seasons or no like as as your lot. like career as a surgeon as a plastic surgeon do you remember yes i do um i finished my fellowship fellowship is i spent one year in doing facial plastics and i was driving home from St. Louis to Los Angeles, and I stopped in Kansas City, and I did my attending, you know, the one of the doctors who trained me, she was a pediatric ear, nose, and throat doctor. I did her facelift on the way home in her surgery center. My first procedure as a okay. trainer. That goes to show you how sort of not smart she was or is because would you let a new trainee do your facelift no. okay. all driving <laughs> no like doing a little stop like yeah. are you like stopping at a gas little station stop. so you have to understand like, oh so we trained i trained at ucla we trained at major universities that do nothing but extremely difficult cases so when during my training i actually did harder cases than i did in my first five years as a plastic surgeon because no one with a really complicated case is going to come to you when you're 36. All right. They don't, they come to the older guys, guys who are like us now. So we did much more complicated cases at UCLA during my training than I did in my first five years of practice. But, you know, I did, uh, we, we've done a lot of very difficult cases. Mm. Wait, that's cool. Cause my, uh, my brother did his fellowship at UCLA too. And he always, he would never tell me who, but he'd always be like, because I, I'm nosy. I'm like, any celebs in today? He's like, yes, I can't tell you who they are, but they stopped by. But I like that you are you LA training. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, your brother's got great training, obviously. He trained at a great institution. He'll, <laughs> he'll nod his head as well with that. Yeah. Wait, speaking of LA, Dr. Terry, congrats on the new house. It's so beautiful. And I, I just saw Heather's post about it. She is so excited. Yeah, so we've been looking for a new project to do. We looked in Cabo, Palm Springs. We looked all over the place. We've got land in Gazer, but we found a very special Hollywood iconic legendary property that's going to take, I think, have, it's going to be botched for real estate. The <laughs> heaven's got to take this amazing property that was built in 1946 and completely redo it. It's going to be fascinating. I call it real estate porn. Because uh, is that why? Because when I was reading, I think it was the Entertainment Tonight article about it. I was like, did they get it for over half? Like they got it for less than half of asking? Yeah, we did. We did. But it needs a lot of work. Um, it's going to really test Heather. I'm sure she'll put it on one of the shows she's going to do. Um, I'm really excited for her, but um uh, I'm just going to stand back and watch. My, my wife is a real estate design genius. I mean, that last house she did, I think you all saw it was amazing. This is going to be next level. At least I hope it's going to be, but we'll see. I feel like the roots just keep being more firmly planted in LA. I'm waiting for that Beverly Hills crossover. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she oh, knows boy. she knows a lot of the Beverly Hills housewives. She's very good mm -hmm. friends with Garcelle and Kyle. And I think, uh, but you know, our roots are in... Orange County, my practice is in Orange County, but we do spend the week, you know, we have a, a new penthouse up here anyway. So we've been kind of leading the dual life for a while. This is just part of that process. I feel yeah, awesome. And then me, I'm actually going to be kind of slowly starting my, uh, uh, an extra practice besides Beverly Hills in Orange County. Uh, oh, so, uh, are we I mean, we might be having the wrong spinoff happening. You might be <laughs> throwing napkins over in Orange County. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to be out there. Yeah, by the way, be, be, be very careful with Tamra. She can really bite sometimes. <laughs> uh, she Tamra is has definitely been Tamraing this season. Dr. Terry, do you have any thoughts on the way uh, Tamra has behaved uh, as she re-enters the Housewives franchise? I know that she and uh, she and Heather are kind. Of, you know, they're always back and forth a little bit. You know, Tamra came in with guns blazing, but Heather and I, we love Tamra. Tamara is an OG of the Real Housewives of Orange County. And I, you know, I think it's exactly what it needed. And she's a lot of fun. You got to be careful with her. All right. But uh, when you're with Tamara, put away the sharp instruments, but you're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> now, as one of the, as one of the men on the show, I am curious your thoughts because a lot of people online are kind of like with the newbie gens, man, they're like, 
very like, it's like ghosts, like you and Danger Girl. They're like, what is happening? Are you, how are you feeling about him? Have you gotten to know him a little bit or? Yeah, we've got, we, I got to know him a little bit on camera and more off camera. I think you'll find, at least I hope you'll find that he's he's a really nice guy. And yeah, he's he's actually quite sweet. He's he's very charming and very likable. Um, and I think if if you don't haven't resonated with him yet, give him a chance mm-hmm. because he's actually a really neat guy. And boy, is he fit! Every time I look at him, I say to myself, "I've got to go to the Who gym." Who are you talking about? This is one of the new housewife Jen's uh, boyfriends. You might if you, if you moved when your practice goes to OC, your other one. If you're in his contact, he might accidentally send you. Um, uh, and a not safe for work photo. Paul, so just prepare. <laughs> Look, I've had okay. He's a really he, he, if you haven't found your way with him yet, right. give him a chance. You're gonna end up liking him. I predict. I really do. Yeah, well, it seems that Jennifer is definitely uh smitten with him, despite all the rumors and what people are saying about him. And I, I think that you know, hopefully, in, in Jennifer's case, ho- hopefully Ryan is capable of change. You know. By the way, isn't Jen awesome? I love Jen. I, you know what? I took a yoga class with her and it was just the best time ever. She is a great addition to the cast, I think. You found a real winner with her. Wait, I don't know if you saw, because uh, Evan had a fun little day over in OC and Heather revealed to him about her bowl at Javier's. Oh. The William Sonoma bowl. And I got to have the Heather soup at Javier's. You had that? It was it delicious. Did you uh, it was- shredded chicken in it? Oh, yeah. It was so, so good. I got it in the special bowl. It felt like a religious experience. Heather, Heather, so there's this amazing, it's off-menu soup at Javier's, you know, Real Housewives of Orange County, Javier's, can't miss it. But Heather likes what Heather likes, okay? So Heather got her own bowls, and they have her bowls there. So if you go to Javier and get Heather's chicken soup in Heather's bowl, it's a very special experience. And healthy. It, it yes, very very healthy. And she also taught us that you can uh, substitute as she likes to do. Instead of getting chips and salsa, you can do sliced cucumbers with pico de gallo and carrots. Which, and carrots, yes, we did that too. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. We try to avoid the when we're going carb light, we go the cucumbers and the carrots, pico de gallo, seen uh, you know peppers because it gets very spicy. Yeah, definitely a way to uh, to keep the weight off. But speaking of keeping the weight off, we do have to ask you guys thoughts on this persisting Ozempic craze. Dr. Terry, I know you had some comments, thoughts, and feelings that you expressed recently, but is there anything that you guys would like to add to this ongoing discussion? Did I? No, so, so I'm a huge fan. I think this is a true miracle breakthrough for obesity, the number one cause of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. However, it's new. And when everything's new, you have to learn how to use it. We doctors don't even know how to use it for weight loss. And what we really don't understand yet is how to use it in people who only have 10, 15, 20 pounds. Okay. So a couple things are for sure. If you're going to use it, don't drink. Okay. Don't overeat and be very, very careful because it's putting people in the hospital and that's not being reported very much. And that's because of this phenomenon called ozempic shaming. We have to stop the ozempic shaming because all ozempic shaming is going to do is prevent people from telling their doctors that they're on it. And it can have a lot of side effects if you're undergoing elective surgery. And if you if you don't admit to doing ozempic shaming, we're not going to learn how to do it properly because no one's talking about it. We need to open up the dialogue and think of it as Botox 10 years ago when no one would admit to it. Now everybody admits to Botox. If somebody's on Ozem because they want to lose weight, celebrate that we have a breakthrough for obesity. All right. It's really good, but be careful and do it under doctor supervision. My two cents is called the Ozempic face that we're seeing a lot more of. And again, these patients are coming in and listen, rightfully so. They've lost 20, 25, 30, 35. Their hemoglobin A1C has dropped. Um, cholesterol has dropped, especially the bad cholesterol. As long as they can keep up that lifestyle um, or a toned down version of it when they're off it, but it's the loose skin. So we're seeing more faces come in with more needing a facelift mm. because again, they've lost a good amount of uh, fat. As long as again, as they, you know, when you lose all that, the skin can droop, especially if elasticity is not great. Yeah. But just don't go crazy, have surgery, and then gain a lot of weight back. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's what you were saying, too, about how 
Uh, there's kind of like the uh, the flip of people used to want like big, big, big. And now everyone's like wanting reductions, wanting removals. And I feel like Ozempic kind of adds into that. Everyone's really going for a little less is more. I want less type of thing. And do you feel though, because a lot of the people, like you said, like that are helping cure obesity with it, it's really helping them. But for the people that are like, let me lose 15 pounds before I have that event. And then is it those people more so that then are like, wait, why is all my skin messed up? Because they didn't really have a lot of weight to lose. So it just kind of like messes them up more. I think it's because of the speed of the weight loss. Mm. You know, the Ozempic is a hormone, okay? And Monjaro is two hormones. And there's a new one coming out called Reddit Troop tripatide that has three hormones that i want that one i'm running it down it's not out <laughs> yet it's in phase three clinical trials but i'm telling you very soon it's going to be in pill form and you're going to be able to lose 10 15 pounds in literally two weeks the faster you lose the weight the more the skin hangs because the elasticity doesn't get to adjust so it's giving us a lot more business plastic surgeons in terms of fillers and operations to remove that skin but go slow Go slow, eat light, don't drink with this stuff because it's giving people pancreatitis. And nobody's talking about that because of Ozempic shaming. And you just, I just had a visual of me and Evan on that pill looking like basset hounds coming into your guys' offices, like just full face droop. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you guys are too young and you're both too thin. So that's not going to happen. I feel like you guys could do like a whole season of botched like uh, Ozempic edition where you are like fixing things with with all the all the different things that come along with that. By the way, this season, we do do a lot of patients who've had extreme weight loss and they either through medical tourism or just going for discount plastic surgery had gigantic problems. One of the patients lost a whole bunch of weight using these drugs and uh, ended up in the ICU three times while she was healing with a flesh eating disease. And I'm not sure what episode, but it's, what does she call that area? Vagina Island? Yeah. Wait, I saw that on one of the episodes, like upcoming episodes. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what, I haven't, my passport hasn't gone there. <laughs> I don't know that island. I never planned to visit, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I plan to visit on this season of Bosch. You guys, thank you so much for taking the time. Danny thank and I are guys. so pumped for and another you season. Up so much for us too. I know. Yeah. Where are we? All, are we good. off to somewhere? No. I mean, I mean, I don't know. Maybe when we're done, we're gonna go have a Paul's, cocktail that he's gonna buy me. Paul's gonna be hey, Paul's gonna make a reservation at an expensive Beverly Hills restaurant. And then as soon as the bill comes, I'm on that path. He's gonna leave. I called Baydar, Bill Radar. As soon as the bill comes. Uh, I, somehow he knows he goes oh i have to go to the bathroom and then suddenly the waiter's there with the bill and i go uh okay you put your credit card down he's okay got i'm <laughs> i'm gonna be working on my beta because that's a great <laughs> skill to have paul i'm yeah. i'm jealous actually the real way i do it is i get up i go to the waiter i say bring the check now <laughs> then i go to the bathroom is that how you yes you, that's, that's the secret okay the the secret to Badar. That bladder hack. We love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Have a good all. one. Bye. Congratulations. Bye. Bye.